Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for joining me on this, uh, this week, this uh, very strange week, a very special uh, uh, time for us to shine, I guess, right? Um, it's March 2020, uh, right in the midst of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And one of the things that's uh, so great about this is, is that uh, for all its, it's you know, uh, horrible things, there is, we try to look for, for good stuff in anything. And um, uh, one, one scientist I love, uh, author I'm going to bring up a few times this week, Peter Diamandis, he said, you know, we, we've, it's united the world. It's, it's made, um, you know, he used to think that what would bring all the different countries together? Would it be like, a, 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 you know, an asteroid or, or would it be, um, a, you know, an alien invasion? And it is. It's an alien invasion. Uh, this is an alien intelligence of, of, of life form, uh, you know, it just isn't necessarily from another planet, but it's uniting the world and it doesn't care about boundaries, geographic or, or cultural boundaries. It's, it's attacking humanity. <clears throat> so now the humans of the world are united. And Peter says, you know, what happens when, when 150 million to 200 million of those scientists and physicists, technologists turn their attention to solving a crisis? <laughs> we science the shit out of it, solve the problem. So uh, I'm an old Star Trek fan, by the way. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, you know, I wear a Star Trek shirt every day. And normally I wear a uh, gold shirt on, on day one for, for command. But today, being in the, you know, the emergency uh, thing here, I'm, I'm wearing my red shirt. So now don't tell me red shirts die. Scotty wore a red shirt. So it's not always true. It's just, you know, higher risk. Uh, but he's the emergency responder. No, no, I've got, I've got, I just said, uh, I wanted to do it because today it's an emergency. I'll, I'll get to the gold. Uh, maybe I'll even change in the middle here. All right, so uh, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to work together. Now, this class is about uh, IT risk management, cyber risk management, but <clears throat> there's really two pandemics going on. There, there's the actual, the, the spread of the virus, but there's also this, a spread of misinformation. And our job here is to secure the information that will help the scientists, right? Well, we'll help. So we're all going to help and make this better. Um, we're going to, by the way, I have a very large class this week, so I don't have time to uh, to, to uh, monitor a lot of the questions. I have a, a number of people here, six people here helping me, including I see my, my chief full of uh, almost 40 years, Tom Up the Grove, one of the greatest hackers, first guy I know to have a computer. And uh, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I have a number of other people here helping me. So... Um, for those of you studying for the CISSP, you have to take a test and understand that uh, <clears throat> it, it's hard to, to um, come to terms with an exam if you don't understand the terms. And a lot of people don't understand a lot of the English terminologies that we use are, are, have root meanings that are important to us. So cyber, uh, a lot of people think means computers. No, it comes from the Greek uh, kybernon, the same root word as govern, and it means to steer. All right, so we're going to talk a little about governance this week, you know, uh, 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 governance, risk, and compliance. And govern means to steer. <clears throat> and when, you, when you're steering, uh, it's an ancient Greek word for steering a ship, um, you have to watch out for danger. You know, you don't want to steer into something that could damage the ship or go the wrong way. You know, support of governance is setting a direction, go the right way, whatever the right way is. You know, I know what wrong is. It's hard to say what right is, um, but we can figure out what's wrong. Uh, anything that would destroy, the, or, you know, compromise the, the uh, safety of the crew or whatever. And, and some of the dangers you can't see. Risk comes from the Greek for the cliffs underwater. These are dangers that could destroy the ship that they can't see. There's, they had no forewarning this was coming. This is going to be real important to us. Risk management is to it, it originally deal with unforeseen risk. Now, if you hit the cliff, don't hit it again. Make a note of that. Because if you don't learn from history, you're forced to repeat those unforeseen dangers. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You can't see that coming again. That's going to be very important to us. This is why when you, when, you, um, when you steer a ship in these days, even if you never uh, went to those waters before, you want to check and see if anyone else ever did. Maybe they hit the cliffs. Maybe someone else learned. So like this pandemic, we've never had a big pandemic in the United States like this. Not, 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 not in my lifetime. Um, I have been studying it. I took business continuity training in uh, Singapore with the Business Continuity International, where their number one concern in 2008. Really threw to me was a pandemic outbreaks. This is when we were talking about alternate site planning. And, you know, you're not just looking for, like in a business continuity plan, alternate data processing facilities. It's alternate end user facilities. And in 2008, uh, it was a shock to me that everybody, and in, in, I took class with a lot of people from uh, Royal Bank of Scotland and some other folks, they all had alternate, they said, you don't want everybody showing up at the alternate site, you know, together in a pandemic outbreak. So everybody could work from home. 
2008, right? 12 years ago. And, and, and here, I know Tom is with us. He's helping people uh, uh, gear up and finding out that some people don't have the, the uh, network um, uh, services capable, you know, to, to spike up and deal with this, the, these issues. So um, hopefully we, could, we should have learned, you know, but we're not going to do that this week. We're not going to pick on what we should have done. We're going to pick on what we should do the next time. Many people like Peter Diamandis and well, a great uh, author wrote a, a fantastic book I'll quote a few times this week, uh, David Sinclair, who wrote Lifespan last year. Um, and the good news, Lifespan was about, you know, reprogramming our DNA to, to, to draw out our lifespan almost indefinitely. But he warned of pandemic outbreaks. And he was uh, on, on the uh, on the interwebs uh, last week, and he was talking about how um, uh, this is not as bad as the next one could be. So let's learn from this. So the next one is even, you know, we're more prepared. But um, the exponential growth, this is pretty awesome. We need to talk about exponentials in this class for, as we're going to talk about the exponential um, <clears throat> growth of, of, uh, of computing processing power, Moore's law, how the information doubles. But we look at this exponential, this doubling rate uh, in this, this thing. And this is last night. Uh, um, it, it's growing very fast. So exponential growth, when you look at it, uh, say, in the number of bits in an IP address, if I had one bit, I would have two addresses, right? If I had two bits, I have four. For If I had 10 bits, I'd have 1,000. If I had 20 bits, I'd have uh, a, a million, right? 30 bits, you have a billion. So things double very fast, and there's that uh, near the curve when things go from a deceptive. You don't notice it, you know, while it's growing slowly, but right around here, things start getting out of whack, and you go, oh, my gosh, it's getting. Now, exponential growth cannot go on forever. Obviously, in the case of, of uh, COVID, it can only spread till how many humans are there? You know, at a certain point, we'd run out of humans. So obviously, this can't go on forever. So that's really the way exponential growth works is with S-curves. We'll talk about this in, uh, in information processing. So, you know, what we're seeing with Moore's law, for instance, is is with uh, you know uh, integrated circuits on chips, and and we're actually pretty up, uh, up to the top of Moore's law. But that's not the first time we saw uh, information doubling. We saw exponential growth uh, in vacuum tubes and in, in, in magnetic relays. Now, with the context of of uh, the COVID nineteen, the saturation point theoretical limit would be all of humanity right that's when we reach not everybody's going to die but, you know the kill rate might be i've seen numbers as low as one percent as high as three percent uh for covid and it's only going to go down as more testing comes up but we'll see um herd immunity would be when we all have gotten it if there was no vaccination <clears throat> or all the ones that were going to get it. How many people are exposed? We'll talk about the exposure. So the saturation point would be all of humanity. Exposure rate, some people say, is about, let's say, 50% of humanity. <clears throat> but if we can develop a, um, a, 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 a vaccine, we can drive that down. We can have more people who are immune, right? The other term you hear is flattening the curve uh, could be flattening the curve could be by developing vaccines, but it could also be by stretching out the timeline you know, of, of how long it takes to get there. Because in that timeline, that gives us more time to one respond. We're going to talk a lot about um, uh, triage and how we have to prioritize and sort out. And this is true with any computer security as well. Um, and, 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 if we can stretch out the timeline, we, we can prioritize a lot easier versus everything coming at once. But it also gives us time to develop a vaccine. So uh, this is our goal. We want to flatten the curve. We want to develop vaccines and uh, we want to uh, you know, get to herd immunity uh, you know, in a reasonable time frame. Now, NIST has an 800 uh, uh, series of documents that you should all be familiar with the, the guidelines from the National Institute of Standard Technologies. And um, 861, pardon me, uh, is for incident handling. And um, a lot of the incidents we deal with are uh, virus outbreaks. And it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm going backwards. It's like when we, when we describe computer viruses originally, it'd be like, well, it's kind of like a, a human virus, right? Only it infects a computer. I've got more experience with computer viruses. I'm actually taking learning COVID and going, oh, so it's kind of like on a computer. <laughs> but the first step in, in this process is to be prepared. Now, we're not going to pick one, uh, you know, people right now. That's not important. We obviously could have been better prepared. 
and, and we're going to learn that and, and, and at the end of this and be better prepared the next time. Our goal is not to, to pick on people. It's to just get better. So uh, when you're prepared, like you're prepared for a flat, you know, you have a spare tire, you have the resources in case something goes wrong. Uh, and then you detect something. You de we're, we're detecting people getting sick. Now, we don't have enough detection kits out there. We don't know, but we're getting reports. Sometimes you detect because somebody died, right? You know, that's the worst way to detect it. When they do the detection, uh, we have to understand detection systems aren't always accurate. <clears throat> so, so my smoke detector might go off when there's not actually a fire, but I'm cooking a steak. So we have false positives. And then also when I, even if it's a, no, it is a positive, this person doesn't ha does have COVID, how bad is it? What are the symptoms? Right. And, and that's when you do your triage and you, you, you understand that we have to analyze this and make sure that we, you know, we handle these things, these, these issues in a logical order. So once you detect, the next step is to sort out, prioritize, triage, right? Do an impact analysis. And then we, here's where we are right now. We're taking containment measures, right? We're, we have to stay in the house or, or, or whatever your containment measures are. Um, we're hoping to eradicate this. That's where we are and recover, get back to work. Now, um, that's our primary focus is getting back to work. It's not picking on bad people. The primary focus is to minimize impact. And get back to work and then we're going to get lessons learned that's the post incident activity when we figure out what exactly happened here how could we be better prepared so uh next time we're ready and that's our goal here so a lot of a lot of overlap here right a lot of lessons we can learn from this um and and this is a teachable moment for me and my students as well now something I've been pushing for years and it's so obvious now during this pandemic. Um, we, we hear about uh, information security as protecting confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the famous CIA triad. And I find, and I've been stressing this in my class, that most people put way too much uh, emphasis on the confidentiality part. And that is not equal security. I've been asking people for years, I say, how many times has anybody here hidden something so well that you yourself don't know where it is? That's not security. That's a denial of service. Right now, we're not looking to make sure that the resources, the PPE, the face masks are confident. Just make sure no one can get to them. No, let's make sure they are available. I've been arguing in my class that availability is the number one security goal. But let's make sure these masks really work. We're having an information uh, 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 pandemic, uh, information misinformation warfare right now. We have to make sure that people have accurate, authentic information that is available. And we're going to talk this week of all the wonderful technologies that we are on the forefront of, of enjoying. We're, we live in the most amazing decade in humanity. So we will get to maturity levels at the, for the next time. We're going to have a uh, blockchain-based um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, so I know that this drug is authentic, these test kits. right? Um, we're going to have AI doing uh, you know, analysis for us and simulations and helping us uh, faster uh, development, you know, rapid development of, of new vaccines and drugs and, 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 and test kits, We're, virtual reality and, and augmented reality. We have a, a, a person here who's going to be uh, helping us with this, uh, by the way, from Peter's group, uh, uh, Ryan Wegner. I don't know if Ryan's in yet, but Ryan uh, is going to be talking for us on Wednesday, and he's a great VR guy. 5G networks, faster speed, faster availability. Drone security. We have a, a couple of talkers this week, by the way, and uh, today uh, I have uh, Seth Rao, and Seth is a, a, a my hero on drone security. So uh, this is, wouldn't it be great if we could use drones to deliver? Um, and, and I think we can next time we'll have these drones worked out so they can deliver whether it's medical supplies or just food. You know, I feel bad for the, uh, I go to the grocery stores and I feel bad for these guys who have to show up at the grocery store. I'm going through the self checkout at the Wawa or the, uh, the the Walmart myself. We've, we've got to be able to look at you know big big data. It's not just your SQL network, you know your SQL database. It's it's these not only SQL big data analytics, and again um, uh, you know delivery whether it's drones or any autonomous vehicles, but they have to get there securely, and that's our job this week to to help iron these things out. So we're going to be much better the next time. We're going to do a lot of lessons learned this week uh, and through this pandemic, and we're just going to get a better society at the end of this. So I'm very hopeful. 
uh, at the same time, I am very concerned and I'm doing my best to, uh, to, to help, you know, everybody, you know, everybody uh, right now takes a role. Staying home and watching TV is helping. We're just staying home, <laughs> you know. Uh, exponential growth. We went through this, and and um, uh, I, I mentioned with Moore's law that he, uh, Gordon Moore, was the founder of co-founder of Intel, and he noticed he was able to double the amount of transistors on a silicon wave for on average every every two years. But because the electrons had uh, less distance to travel, it was actually doubling. Uh, processor speed in as little as 12 months, I believe on average, they say it's about 18 months. And um, things have just gotten so fast that uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, I, I knew as a musician, it's a founder of the uh, uh, Kurzweil keyboard, but he's actually a, a very brilliant computer scientist uh, now at, at Google, chief scientist over there. And uh, Kurzweil points out that um, at this rate, we're going to have artificial intelligence that will be as smart as a human. And I'm not talking about, like, we've already got AIs that are much smarter than humans in one thing, right? I mean, but um, um, Deep Blue can play chess. I don't know they can play checkers. So uh, when we say as smart as a human, they're talking about artificial general intelligence, AGI. And um, he thinks we'll get there about 2029. Now, when an AI is less smart than a human or whenever an exponential is below the number one, we don't notice it. It's in a deceptive phase. All right. So it's whatever. It's as smart as a, a one-celled animal, whatever. And then it gets smart. And then finally, it gets, it's as smart as a, a chimpanzee. It's as smart as the village idiot. A couple hours later, it's as smart as Einstein. Then it's twice as smart, four times as smart, 16 as smart. And we're going to get to a point where we're going to have AIs um, you know, we're talking Alexa and Siri, not, not some master computer that, you know, the, some evil emperor uses, but everybody that is smart as all humans by 2045. And he calls that the technical singularity. It's hard to predict what life is going to be like when, when everybody has access to, a, you know, something that's as smart as every human put together. I don't know about you, but I think that if I had somebody just twice as smart as me helping me with my problems, a lot of my problems would go away. When you get billions of times smarter, a lot of our problems get solved. I am not a fear monger. I do not believe that this is going to lead to the Terminator. I actually think it's going to be awesome. Uh, so we're going to talk more about that this week. Um, I don't think it'll be perfect. You know, I use a technology in fire. Uh, fire um, is a wonderful thing. We, my research it now looks like uh, maybe it's accidentally we may have been using fire in the end just all you know picking up something that was on fire after a um, after a lightning storm maybe 70 80 thousand years but <clears throat> as far back as like 30 thousand they have evidence that we've been creating fires that's um 25 thousand years before we had writing we've only been writing for five thousand but we've been using fire for at least 30. so you think we've mastered it by now no in the united states alone people die every couple of hours in a fire so I don't expect uh, AI to be risk-free any more than I expect fire to be risk-free. And we're going to use that analogy a lot this week. We have a lot of internet-connected devices that can also help us in our detection systems, right? So if we're, you know, we're prepared and then we detect issues. Imagine if we all had on our phones diagnostic kits that could um, tell us if, if you know, our, our health states. And, and they have uh, X prizes. Peter Diamandis is the founder of the X prize. One of his X prize was a, um, a tricorder that would be able to, uh, you know, like hook up to your phone or something. And the average person could not just have like a thermometer, but they could diagnose a bunch of things. Qualcomm won this X prize years ago. Why is it not here? Watched a guy talk about that. And he said, because for every new technology they come out with, they find out that he said, for every cool feature we came out with, we also found out we were, we were violating 10 HIPAA rules. It's hard as we watch them develop right now. We're looking for vaccines. They can't just try a chemical. Here, people try that. They've got to go through checks. And when we do our development life cycle this week, we're going to talk about functionality and assurance testing, right? Does the system give the features I want and how well do they perform those features? When it comes to pharmaceuticals, they call that efficacy, the effectiveness, is it have the functionality and safety. Yes, it kills the virus, but it also killed Bob. So we have to go through a lot of compliance requirements to get a drug approved. Even a fast-track drug is going to take months, you know, 
to, we'll do our best, but we can, we can be picking these things up and, and getting much smarter. And I'm sure we will. Now, um, my mother uh, taught me to be um, uh, very suspect that, that, you know, I said, this is a massive information uh, uh, campaign going on too, as well. Um, and my mother taught me that there are four kinds of information. We often only hear three. We often hear about the things you know that you know, the things you know that you don't know, and the things you didn't know that you didn't know. So this would be like having a chest of drawers, and I have a, um, a drawer that says shirts in it, and when I open the drawer, I see shirts, things I know that I know. I have another drawer that's marked private, and it's locked, and I can't get in it. I know there's something in there. I don't know what it is. I know I don't know it. Things I know that I don't know. But there was a hidden panel in the back. I didn't know that. Things I didn't know that I didn't know. But that's not where my missing shirt was. Turns out it was actually in the, a drawer marked pants. There are things you think you know that turn out to be wrong. And that's the worst type of information, the most damaging. This is why fake news you know, spreads, because people think it's true when it's not. This is how viruses spread in the computer world. You don't click on a piece of code that says evil virus. You clicked on that virus because you thought it was your bank. Because that's what they wanted you to think. As a martial artist, you don't just you know, throw a, a jab. You, you might first throw a, 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 a low kick and, and, and because you wanted them to think you were doing that. Then you throw the jab. Or you might fake the jab and throw the hook, right? Because that's what you wanted you to think. My mother taught me that. My mother taught me, I, I tell the story a lot, but it was, I, when I was a little kid, I would say, yeah, comic book fan and uh they had these little uh contests and it was like if you could draw skippy the turtle you know send it into us it was a little advertisement in the, in the comic book somewhere <clears throat> so they send it in and if if uh if, if we'll have a team of uh, experts go over your your drawing and assess whether or not you have the aptitude to be part of our our art school which my mother pointed out was a correspondence art school that you paid for so she said you mean do you have the aptitude to send them money I was all proud of my drawing. I said, mom, what do you think? She goes, oh, you're going to win. I said, it looks just like it, right? No, you're going to win because they, everybody wins, Larry. No, no, it says that a team of experts will go over my drawing. Oh, Larry, that's what they want you to think. I want you to think of that all the time. You have to, yeah, you know, when you buy a piece of fruit, you, you got to you, you, you like smell the bottom of a melon or squeeze, a, you know, an orange or something. Uh, that, you've got to check it out. You got to check out the truth. You got to pass the smell test, right? And you got to understand that people are telling you things because they want you to think that and it's not necessarily true. And you have to become a little, and, and, and my mother was also very proud that people were always trying to get you. We grew up very poor. So she was, you know, away of, of scams. Um, <laughs> I'd say I take her to the Chinese buffet. Don't fill up on the rice and the breads, Larry. That's how they get you. You eat the meat, you eat the fish. But she could also uh, uh, read and, uh, and speak of many um, European languages, including uh, Latin and Greek. And she could tell you the origin of words. She was great at like the New York Times crossword puzzle. Fantastic. So, yeah. She was like the father from my big fat Greek wedding. She could tell you the Greek origin of any word. Pretty much. Pretty much. She, she went to Catholic school and she said, uh, I always thought it was from the Latin, Larry, but the Latin stole it from the Greeks. Uh, the coach role, I'm a coach this week. I'm, I'm not a master. And um, uh, here's a picture of me with one of my coaches who's with us this week. There's Tom up the Grove. First guy I know to have a computer. Best hacker I know. Guy can make anything work. <laughs> it's just amazing. And Tom's going to be doing a uh, uh, demonstration. Tom and I are developing a new... Um, <clears throat> kind of a CEH light class or prep. It's a, uh, uh, a security assessment and testing class, right? Following like NIST and, and CIS control. So we'll, we'll talk about that on Thursday, but thank you very much, Tom, for uh, being with us and, and supporting me this week for 40 years. This guy's been supporting me. And there we are with uh, Tom's teacher and mine uh, as well, Joe Lewis, my grandmaster. Uh, and Joe uh, always says, don't, don't follow. He said, don't follow me. I make a lot of mistakes in life, guys. I hate followers. You know, when I make a mistake, I need help. And you know who can't help me? Followers. So he told us, don't have followers. Don't be a follower. You, you have fellowships with other leaders. And he said, we're not masters. We're coaches. Joe uh, was a, a, a friends with Bruce Lee. Joe was the, the uh, creator of American kickboxing. 
and great friends with Bruce Lee. And he, he said, Bruce Lee taught us that, you know, styles limit you. So he created Jeet Kune Do style. Would you think I'd go teach in Jeet Kune Do style? It'd be stupid. I'd miss the point. So I made up Joe Lewis style. And when I'm gone, don't go teach in Joe Lewis style because you'd be missing the point too. <clears throat> so he wanted us to make up our own styles. Tom is Tom up the Grove Mixed Martial Arts. And I'm a very grateful third degree black belt under Tom. Uh, we're here learning cyber kung fu. That's our style. So Tom and I made that up. Uh, on our uh, Joe Lewis black belt is a, uh, an ethic that uh, overlaps a lot with the ISC square code of ethics that I will not permit considerations of race, religion, national origin, or social standing to influence in any way my relations with my students. I'm so grateful to have you people from all over the world here. Uh, and, and I hope you all feel uh, respected and, and, and everything. And, and just wonderful. We, we share information. We all get much smarter. And uh, just like the, the uh, COVID virus, you know, it, it doesn't care about race, religion, right? So, so this is me. My major love is music. Uh, it's not paying real well. So I'm also a uh, computer geek. Tom and I were old uh, Commodore 64 guys. That's how I surfed the internet when it first came out. But I have been involved in uh, professionally in IT since uh, the early 80s. So here I was as an IBM PC repair guy. And uh, it's me. Back in uh, 1985, I was a Novell CNE in 1990, IBM Advanced Connectivity in 88, whatever. CEH in 2002, blah, blah, blah. Just means I, I know how to pass tests. You know, I, I'm good at multiple choice. Our schedule here, we're gonna be doing uh, a couple domains a day that won't totally overlap here. I've been noticing that um, lately, uh, Security engineering is going to go into day three as well, and network security will overlap into day four. We've also got uh, sessions by some wonderful guests this week, uh, every lunch. So uh, 1230 to 130, we're going to be uh, entertained each day by um, some uh, a friend of mine who stepped up and, and uh, offered to do some, some presentation. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be doing a, a, like 50 minutes or so, 45 minutes, uh, maybe up to an hour, and taking 50, uh, 20 minute breaks in the middle. Um, please remember that if you're taking the CISSP test, this test does not have uh, you know, a question with one right answer, and you have to find it. No, 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 there, there's a question, there are four answers, one of those answers is better than the other. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean the other ones are wrong. Larry drives A, a vehicle, B, uh, a Honda. Well, I, I do drive a Honda, but that's, that's also a vehicle, but I, I think the other ones work better. Sometimes it's the answer that just solved the problem in the least amount of time or least amount of cost. You're not in business for security. So we want to solve this problem in the least amount of time without spending too much money. We don't want to hurt the economy, right? We don't want the, the deaths to go on. Um, if you're also a, a test taker, please know that this is much more than a technical test. It's a process management test. And uh, the biggest thing I hear for the last two years on the CISSP is that people get a lot of development lifecycle questions. And we're going to go over a lot of development lifecycle stuff. But when we talk about requirements, I said, we're, this is the functional and assurance requirements, but in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals, they talk about efficacy and safety. That's what we're working on right now. One of the reasons you think you know something turned out to be wrong is because you read it wrong or you heard somebody wrong. Oh, I thought you said, no, I didn't say that. I swore you said, somebody is, uh, said, we're going to be watching, um, uh, lawyers subpoena Alexa in like divorce cases. How many times have you thought you heard something, got upset with somebody and found out that's not what they said? I know I've made that mistake. I could be a bonehead sometimes. When you take the test, this is a very tricky word of exam. You have to read it carefully. All right, it's the things you think you know that turn out to be wrong. If I had a drawer marked shirts again and there were shirts in there, uh, that would be something I knew that I knew. But if I had a drawer marked private and it was locked, that would be something that I knew that I didn't know. I can't get into it. And then there's the hidden panel in the back. Right? And all these relate to 
the things you uh, know that you know, right? that's the shirts, the things I know that I don't know, private, and the things I didn't know that I didn't know, the hidden panel. But the fact that my pants, uh, the, you know, the drawer that says pants didn't just have pants in it, I didn't even bother because that's where it was. Oh, this is how most attacks work. This is the battle we are fighting right now. There's a lot of misinformation and we have vulnerabilities for misinformation because people are eager for information. So, no, some guy said so. No swallowing bleach is not a good thing to kill the virus. I don't know about efficacy, but it's not safe. Attacks on information can be passive. That's when, when people are just eavesdropping on you. We're not really worried about that during this virus right now. We're going to talk about it a lot during the week, but that would be like sniffing, you know, uh, just eavesdropping. If someone were eavesdropping on this conversation and that maybe they had some listening device from across the street, I couldn't tell. They're not sending anything to me that I could pick up. So it's common knowledge that uh, eavesdropping is a passive attack. It's, it's undetectable. I could have soundproofed the room. Passive attacks are undetectable, but they are preventable. I could have encrypted the data. But misinformation campaigns, and these are quite detectable. This is when Mallory is transmitting, but all types of uh, attacks this week. Oh, what's going on here? <laughs> I see, Martine. My daughter's uh, texting me. She's in here, and she apparently her cat's watching me. Um, I, I'm a, a Star Trek fan, as I said, and uh, I use a lot of analogies in my class, and we're going to talk a lot about the ISO. Uh, a lot of people think that's an acronym for International Standards Organization. It is not an acronym. It's a word. In fact, if this were an acronym... Uh, for the United States, the, the, in English, I should say, rather, that uh, the organization would be I-O-S, not I ISO. No, that's a word. It comes from the Greek. It means equal. Last count, 160 members from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And just like the virus treats us equal, we're going to treat, uh, treat each other equal. You know, the... Um, for us, it's, it's to understand some international standards with, with regards to uh, uh, information security. But it's, it's important just in life to treat people like equal, right? And, and if the red light means stop, I don't care what country you're from. You should stop. And, and, and you know, there's no ex exceptionalism. And, 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 uh, and no picking on people, you know. Now you have to wait during green lights. No, they should be able to go. That's our goal. Uh, one of the sad things for our lack of preparation in the United States, keep in mind we're one of the richest nations in the world, um, we, could, we could turn around and, and spend some money fast. The poorer nations who have maybe even gotten hit yet are going to get hit really bad. So, but we come together as a team. We develop this vaccine. Sooner than later, we can flatten this curve and we can, we can mitigate the damages. That's our goal. Uh, a lot of times you'll see movies where they'll have like a devil and an angel on, on the shoulder of, of the uh, protagonist, you know, giving them advice. No, do it this way. Well, I, I, as a Star Trek fan, I have Kirk and Spock on my shoulders. And they're my uh, quantitative and qualitative guys. This is going to help us a lot this week. Uh, one of the top feedbacks, I've been using this analogy for 20 years. I've been teaching this class for almost 20 years, 2001 I started. And um, uh, I, probably I'd say, if not the number one feedback, number two, is Kirk and Spock help them take your class. In fact, a lot of Kirk. Spock is your quantitative guy. He can count the quantities of things. So for instance, I have an instrument here. I have a ukulele. It's an object. It has a quantity of four strings. Spock can tell that. Spock is very good at that type of thing. Spock would, would measure that and say, yep, I know what that ukulele is. It's uh, four strings, it weighs this much, this object, and I'm quite certain. Is the music Larry plays good? 
the person who plays the music is a subject. I can tell you what bad music is. If it's out of tune or out of time, no one's going to like it. But if it's in tune or in time, it's not bad. I just don't know if it's good. It depends. That's very qualitative. The fact that it's four strings, that's a quantity. When I take a test, I let Spock try to rule out wrong answers. Because he quantitatively, we do that. But Kirk subjectively is, is valuing other things. He's looking at the clock. He knows how much money he paid on the test. And he says, when Spock takes a while for, for some things he can't roll out, Spock, where are we on question 35? Captain, it's not A because symmetric is faster than asymmetric. And it is not B because SHA is a hashing algorithm. Is it C? or D? Insufficient data, Captain. I've never been to this planet. I don't know who Ron Rivest is. Spock, we haven't got time. I'm picking C. Why? Because we haven't picked C in a while. So at a certain point, you have to watch the clock. You can do your best to rule out certain wrong answers. Sometimes when you take the test, two of the answers on average, I find out are objectively wrong. There's two other answers that aren't wrong, but one's subjectively better. And you have to figure out why. And we're going to do that all week. We're going to understand why a certain answer might be better from the context or subjective uh, uh, experience of a security manager versus, say, a user or a custodian. When you manage risk, you, you, you look for ways to prevent, detect, and respond. So, for instance, with this... Uh, horrible thing that's going on. Pre preventive controls are things like social distancing, um, a, a vaccine, uh, detection, test kits, right? Uh, and, and response. If somebody is sick, we're not giving them the vaccine, we're giving them something to ease their suffering, you know, respirators, right? So those are that's how we manage this. But our leaders have to provide governance. What direction are we going? And that's one of the hardest parts. And as a teenager, I fell in love with a book called uh, The High Frontier by Gerald O'Neill. And he felt the direction we were going into is space. And um, one of his students uh, became much more uh, uh, successful than I am at this point, uh, and, and that is um, uh, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Jeff Bezos was a student of Gerald O'Neill. I was a big fan of this guy. And his book came out, I think, in 77. I discovered it in 79. Thanks to Tom Up the Group, my instructor. Uh, and um, I, I've been in love with this concept. And, and I believe that this is where we're headed. And, and uh, I think we'll be here in the next 100 years. And Jeff Bezos wants to get there much sooner. And he may be right. So we'll see what happens. Uh, all the artwork from my slides, by the way, come from these old NASA drawings of these space colonies uh and uh they they're free to use but by don davis and rick guidance they just ask for the credit so there we go we're going to use that as a backdrop uh, i also want to give a shout out to peter diamandis who um i told you he was the founder of the x prize originally also a big uh, jerry o'neill fan when he was in school uh, Peter also is the author of a number of books that uh, the most influential books of the last 10 years of my life. Abundance, the future is better than you think. Uh, it shows me that forget what you see on the, the uh, constantly negative news, uh, the, <laughs> whatever. The, the news stations have to get your attention. Your, your um, amygdala, the part of your brain that senses danger that we're all feeling right now, the part that's giving us anxiety because of this the virus, that's the amygdala. When it senses danger, it has to take over uh, priority of our CPU. Um, but uh, advertisers know that to get our attention, they can constantly overwhelm us with dangerous information. So you watch the news and they want to get your attention. They're constantly telling you about bad things. But the world is very quietly getting much, much better. You know, people look at the good old days. What good old days? What good old days are you talking about? You know, it's a hundred years ago, infant mortality in the United States was over 40%. By the time a child reached five, there's more than a four in 10 chance of dying in the United States a hundred years ago. The risk of your wife dying, giving birth a hundred years ago was really high. 
we have made life much better. We live longer. We work less. We are healthier than we've ever been. And it's only getting better. Um, so uh, uh, recently he updated this book uh, to the future is fast. And you think just showing how quickly the, the things are getting better. We're moving from a world of, of, uh, uh, of scarcity when, 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 you know, there's only so much food to go around. Of course, we have to compete for the food but we're getting to a point where there's more than enough to go around. We're moving to a world of abundance. Where we'll have enough energy, enough uh, electricity, enough computing power, enough food, enough uh, a leisure time. AIs are taking over our jobs. And you know, I, I think some of the great thing that's coming out of this, uh, this horrible time is like UBI, universal basic income. If we can get robots to drive the trucks, to stock the shelves, to take away. So people aren't putting themselves at risk. Why send them back to work? But what are you going to do? Let them starve? No, let's continue to pay people. We're going to have enough money to go around, you guys. We don't have to compete. We are moving to a world of abundance and cooperation. And I'll hopefully demonstrate that this week. I've invited Peter, by the way, to give a talk as we could see if he can. I know he's very, very busy, but I'm hoping maybe he can come out say hi to the group. Uh, but th this whole thing, this abundance mindset, uh, it, it, w abundance is when, when, you, when you don't worry about that there's enough to go around. They say people are much more likely to be very um, uh, compassionate when, when they feel ab abundance or, or that um, you collaborate, you know, as opposed to compete. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a very large group here. Uh, see, I'm, we have almost 60 people in so far. Um, and uh, I've been, <laughs> gotten the help of uh, several wonderful people. So from Sec Reliant, I have uh, the founders, Monica Pearson and Seth Rouse. Seth's going to be doing a talk here, but they'll also be helping me monitor your questions. Uh, Maurice Castro Nuovo, who I uh, already been talking with back and forth. Mo, Mo and I were at IBM uh, in the 90s, and uh, Mo is a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, Active Directory guy, Azure guy, and there's a lot of cloud stuff. So he's going to be giving a talk for us uh, tomorrow on access controls in Active Directory and, and migrating these up. Uh, Ryan Wegner from uh, Sentient, uh, he was a um, uh, endpoint security guy for, for uh, 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 Drawing a blank here, uh, <laughs> teasing because it was the big thing during the impeachment. The uh, um, oh, who was the security company that did the? Uh, uh, they're they're not a, a Ukrainian company, but whatever. Uh, uh, it's Ryan's an expert at that, but Ryan's also great at virtual reality, and I'm going to pick it pick in his brain there. Tom Up the Grove, you've met my my martial arts coach, uh, founder of Internet Network Service, and the co-creator of our Cyber Kung Fu program. Mike Vienne, I don't know if Mike's here yet. Mike is like my hero from a high level of penetration testing. So Mike Vienne does incident response and forensics, but at like reverse engineering malware, this is the genius stuff to me. I, I always feel like a fraud because I'm a packet analyst and uh, you know, I know like whatever the 20 bytes of an IP header. And people act like that's great. And I'm like, it's nothing. It's seventh grade shop, but whatever. If you want to think I'm smart, that's great. Taking malicious code that's millions of lines, you know, and then taking this compiled code and reversing it, it deassembling, disassembling it and looking at this stuff and trying to tell me what it does. That's awesome stuff. And that's where Mike's at. So I'm very honored to have Mike with us. He's going to help us on Friday looking at malware. And uh, Martine Greenblatt, she's uh, my my daughter, who uh, uh, been helping us this week and answer some questions. So Martine is a uh, business major in college and uh, working from home this week and helping dad. So that's our goal. We want to pass the exam, but we also want to obviously protect society. 